Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Money Matters podcast, the show where we discuss important financial topics that were never covered in med school. I'm your host, Dr. Tarang Patel. Okay, we continue with part two of my interview with Doc G, an internist in Chicago, about how he was able to 5X his income and achieve a high net worth at a relatively young age. Uh, if you haven't listened to part one, that's episode 37. This is episode 38. Um, so if you haven't listened to part one, I encourage you to listen to that episode first. And now back to the interview with Doc G. Now, let me ask you. So you, you decided to then you got out of that practice uh, and you decided to add in the, the home home based practice. How did you how did you kind of come up with that? I mean, we've heard of concierge medicine. Did you what kind of made you go into that? that uh, where you're going to pay patients homes. All right. So this is actually kind of a funny story. I have another life outside of Doc G and Diversify um, in which I was a moderately known blogger on another site and I wrote a lot about medicine. And so through social media, I was very involved in social media kind of in the early days of Kevin MD. And, and you know, I was I was very involved. And through social media, I met this guy who was brilliant. And he worked out of Miami and he had started, I'm not going to name the name of the company, but he had started a very well-known company that gives medical advice. And the company itself wasn't making him much money, but it gave his name a huge amount of search engine optimization on Google. So, you know, what he kept on telling me, so he had this great practice, right? Right. His practice was a fee-only practice that you would call him and he would come to wherever you were in the Miami area and see you. And who he attracted was travelers, mostly from Europe, and a lot of them had travel insurance. So these people from Europe would come to Miami to vacation. They would Google, they'd get sick, they would Google you know, doctor in the area, and he had such great search engine optimization, he would come up right away. They would call him, and often they didn't care how much it cost because they were getting reimbursed from their insurance anyway. So he would charge somewhere between $500 and $1,000 for a visit. And he would show up, he'd spend two or three hours with them, he'd get to know their families, he would, he would sit around, talk with them, drink coffee, bring his own bag of medicines. You know, he had basic medicines, antibiotics with him. He would go see these patients, charge them, get reimbursed. They would pay him cash right up front. Then the patients mostly would get reimbursed on their own. Uh, And he was making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year this way and was seeing two patients a day. And so he told me, he said, Doc, your office is a huge loss of money. He's like, I go places, I make all this money. And guess what? I have no overhead. He had to pay for his car. He had to pay maybe for an ad here or there. Almost everything was done for him already. And it really got me thinking. I said, it's true. I sink 50% of what I make into my overhead. If I could just get rid of my overhead, I'd be doing fantastically. So when I went into this concierge practice, I was creating a new revenue stream because I was getting paid a yearly fee, which I had never gotten paid before. So immediately I was making more money. I charged $1,800 and I had 100 patients. So that's $180,000 extra, okay? But then I got my office overhead down to about $100,000. And the reason why it was so low is because all I had was a personal assistant, a little small office space somewhere, and that was it. I didn't even have an answering service. My personal assistant answered the phone during the day, and then my office phone went right to my cell phone at night. So that's what kind of really took me. So we talk about I made 1X or $125,000 when I first came out of residency. By the time I left that practice, I was making between 2 or 3X. When I started my new practice, you know, I got into the mid-3s. When I did this... I mean, I was actually making a lot more than 5X. I I probably topped out, I think, in my most lucrative year, and I I really slowed down after this because I started seeing that it wasn't worth it. I made about $950,000. That is fantastic. I mean, again, it's not just about the 
uh, you know, the, the dollar number is irrelevant, but I, I really just like the fact that, you know, you uh, throughout the stages of your career analyzed it, made changes, uh, opt, you know, the, the keywords, optimized, things like that. Um, but you really did that. And, and a lot of us, like I said before, we kind of stay, you know, stagnant or maybe make minor improvements. That That's fantastic what you did. I really uh, want to applaud that because, you know what, even if it didn't work out for you, I just just the attempts made, I think, are, are what's really important. And I think that, you know, the lessons learned, uh, successful or not, are things that, that a lot of physicians can benefit uh, from. So, uh, but hey, it, it, if the fact that it did succeed is just that much of a bonus, so that's that's fantastic. Um, you know, and so you you hit that five x point, and you mentioned, um, you know, you started seeing okay, maybe it wasn't worth it. What made you think that? So it was a long road, uh, and it started with a guy who you probably know uh, named Jim Dowie uh, from the White Coat Investor. So as I had mentioned, I had a moderately successful blog about medicine out there in the world. And about 2014, I got an email from this guy named Jim. And Jim said, hey, I just wrote this book. I'm trying to get feedback on it. I'd love for you to read it and to post something on your website. So, you know, a week later, the white coat investor comes in the mail uh, and I read it and I'm like, wow, I'm doing 90% of this, but not the other 10%. And I was like, that 10% was really eye opening. Um, and so I said, well, he's got a website and I started reading his website back in 2014. And I had always known when I went into medicine, I went into medicine for the passion, but I quickly saw over the years that what I had passion about wasn't what medicine was anymore, right? The going in the room, sitting with patients, holding their hand, talking to them, making the hard diagnoses, all that great stuff that we really relish in residency was really being replaced by doing paperwork and typing into a computer. So I knew that the trade-offs weren't as much worth it anymore. I was getting a great salary, um, but the stress and fear and anxiety and worry and phone calls, um, I knew that I didn't want to be in that situation forever, the high stress, uh, high volume practice. So I started thinking about, well, how am I going to pull back? How am I going to find revenue streams outside of medicine? How am I going to take this wealth that I've accumulated and turn it into a good life. Cause remember the money actually in the end really doesn't mean anything. I mean, money comes and money goes, but how you spend your time and having the power and freedom to do what you want is really what we're after. So kind of 2014 was, it was a inflection point because I started really thinking and reading, not just about finances. I kind of already got finances and now I was not perfect. I made lots of mistakes and certainly by reading his material as well as Physician on Fire and a bunch of other people, uh, I was able to hone my skills quite a bit. But more importantly, it started giving me a clear pathway to start living that life I wanted free from worrying about the revenue generation. Now, I enjoy revenue generation. I enjoy working. I enjoy creating businesses. Um, but I didn't want I didn't want the stress to be there forever uh, so that that was really a, a big point for me and that that's kind of when I really started thinking about everything so um so over the last few years you've kind of uh you, you, like you said you've changed focus um and then I I think I saw on your website so you you've now um have you stopped the uh, concierge practice or uh, cut back significantly? I did. In 2018, I decided to sunset the practice. Again, looking at my finances, knowing that I had really more than enough. Uh, that was the one part of my practice, though I enjoyed it quite a lot, was quite stressful because you could get a phone call at any time. And because uh, you were being paid for these extra services above and beyond what Medicare dictates. People really expected you to show up and they wanted you to show up at funny times and they wanted to call and discuss their relationship with their sister and why it wasn't going right. Things that really I didn't have a lot of uh, professional ability to manage. Um, and I realized that, you know, I was working really, really hard and I thought, why am I doing this? I have enough. I don't need to make more money. You know, why keep pushing? 
Now, some of that is I'm, that's part of my personality. I enjoy pushing past. I enjoy doing things and creating things that other people can't. So there's a certain joy in getting there and achieving. Um, but I think I started to realize there's probably more healthy ways to do that. So the first thing I did is I said, well, what, what's causing me a lot of stress? And that was one of the first things. And so um, let's just talk a little bit about your personal life. You're, you're married. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And you have kids? Yep. I have a 10 and 13 year old. Okay. Okay. So one of the, one of the biggest, um, uh, you know, either uh, symbiotic successful parts or, or sometimes antagonistic effects um, can, can be, uh, you know, a, a person's uh, spouse or partner. Um, so how... How is your relationship with your wife in terms of the financial? Um, are you are you guys kind of on the same page, or uh, you know how how has that been? Uh, we're very very much on the same page. Um, so I grew up in a fairly stable middle class family. She grew up um, an immigrant to the U.S. and did not have much. So we both were in a sense frugal, that we didn't just spend money willy nilly from the beginning. Uh, she also is a professional and always wanted to be a professional. Um, so she has a very, uh, big engaged career too. Um, so we really do well together. Uh, we don't spend frivolously. Uh, we like a lot of the same things. Uh, she, you know, I, I wrote a post about this. So you know, she on her own became a millionaire through her 401k, despite me, you know, she, she went and over the last 20 years, put in as much as she could into her 401k, and she made the right investments, and she got all sorts of bonuses at work. So, you know, even without me, she kind of did her own thing. Uh, I would say there's one point um, that we are not exactly on the same page with, and that's early retirement. Um, I look at the numbers and I say, hey, we have way more than enough. I can do nothing or do just what I love. Uh, she's not quite there yet. <laughs> I've been trying to convince her to to leave her job for quite a while because she hasn't been as happy at it. But I, I don't know if she's kind of emotionally there yet. That's a good good uh, good problem to have. You know, I think a lot of people are are talking about early retirement, um, and and you know, it seems kind of funny because when you and I the the time that we came out of med school, you know. Um, I don't think it was really so prevalent, uh, people talking about this and, and specifically our, you know, more senior mentors, uh, and, and attendings, you know, you saw a good number of them who are still practicing, you know, well into their sixties. Uh, and that, that's still the case, but I, I feel like you see a lot of physicians now in their thirties, uh, forties, um, and, and definitely, uh, early fifties who are, you know, ready to look for the early retirement path. So, is do you think that that's more of an indictment on on medicine or is it just uh, just a general change in in culture itself you know i think it's both you know i i medicine is not what it was when you and i started um it's changed quite a bit and the thing you know it, it's hard to explain to someone who hasn't gone through it um it's sometimes even hard to explain to medical students when you are reaching for that goal of becoming a doctor, um, you come at it with the most pure and honest ideas of what it's going to be. And then you go through residency and you start practicing and you get older and wiser and you have children and you realize that that dream and that purity is not exactly reality. Um, Medicine is not rushing into the room, saving the day and everyone smiling and patting on each other on the back. It's not even rushing into the room saying there's nothing we can do. And then you smiling and patting everyone on the back and helping someone go, you know, in a good way. It's it's there's a lot more gray. Medicine is difficult and it can be painful. Uh, and we as physicians can struggle um, with the decisions we make. Um, so. At baseline, becoming a doctor is hard. And I think in previous generations, it was always this hard, but the payoffs were immense. And I'm not talking about financial. Um, I'm talking about the payoffs of when you did this 30 or 40 years ago, the respect in the community was at an all-time high. The, the pay was also really good. And also, 
you know, your spouse and your family kind of accepted that that's what you did and you weren't expected to be there um, for your kids or your spouse. And that was completely acceptable. And I'm not saying that was right. It just is what it was. Nowadays, we face all the same trauma and difficulty of being a physician that they had 30 or 40 years ago, but we're also beat with this mound of paperwork and the compliance and the regulation and the politicians saying that doctors are being paid too much. And so it's, I think, a little bit more painful. So I think it's very common now for people to come out and realize, hey, this physician gig, it's great and I like helping people, but it's a, it's a, it's a exciting world out there and there are other things I could do um, that might be a little bit less stressful. And so so I think I think people have also changed. I think there's a big move towards work life balance, um, but I think it's both. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, like you said, you know, the, definitely the external pressures um, are are different now, and and they're always evolving. But but the overall emphasis on cost uh, containment, which you know I think is is good. Healthcare is extremely expensive in this country, but it is a little bit misdirected that it's always targeted towards the physician. Um, and, and as opposed to, you know, figuring out what, what some of the other, uh, big cost centers in medicine are, um, are, are driving out good, good physicians, uh, from practice. And I think ultimately, unfortunately, it'll be detrimental to, um, our, our society as a whole. But, but that being said, I cannot fault any, one uh, physician uh, from feeling this way because I think a lot of us do. Um, and, you know, I think people, uh, physicians such as yourself, uh, Jim Dolly, are doing uh, the community, um, Physician on Fire, they're doing the community a great service um, in terms of educating, you know, uh, about financial independence and, you know, just, just making smarter financial decisions. Uh, you know, so that you do have choices. So again, I want to I want to thank you uh, for for your blog. It's really uh, interesting. Um, you have got some very interesting articles on there, and I want to uh, encourage our listeners to to check out your blog. But I wanted to um, ask you one one last thing uh, in terms of you know financial independence. This is a debate that that many of us have, and it's, it seems to be a common one on the uh, various physician groups on social media, is about the savings rate. You, you and I were talking a little bit before we started recording um, about, you know, spending um, and, and some of the, uh, you know, the, the physician blogs advocate a pretty uh, strenuous rate of, uh, of savings, which will help you get to financial independence early, but, you know, may not lead to the easiest lifestyle while you're getting there. So that, tell me a little bit about your savings rate um, or, or, you know, or you can change it to your spending rate um, and, and how it's evolved over time. So we've been pretty consistent savers. Um When I was in residency and my wife had just started her job, our goal was we'll save one salary and live off the other. And we've kind of always used that method, even as we've gone further. So, you know, we probably save upwards of 50%, and we mostly always did. Um, But there really is a caveat. And this is, I'll tell you, so people look at me and they say, wow, you're worth this much money, you have enough, you're kind of at the top of the mountain, you're financially free, you're independent. Here's what I think after going through all this and about after thinking it through it really deeply. I think we should create the life that's good for us and that feeds us and that makes us happy now, regardless of where we are on this financial independence pathway, and then allow financial independence to take as long as it has to. In other words, I could have done this maybe much slower but then really concentrated on enjoying myself and being content and building strong relationships and really living life. And if I had really decided to focus on that and make a little bit less money, you know, that would have been fine too. If it took me five or 10 more years to become financially independent, but I really enjoyed the path, uh, I don't think that's time lost. So what I've come to where I am is find a way to really feel like you're doing your life's work and that you're enjoying it and that you're where you need to be and plan on doing that forever. And I imagine if you're careful enough, if you don't spend frivolously, 
uh, if you try to save when you can, uh, eventually you'll make enough money to be okay. Absolutely. I, I think that's a very good philosophy. Um, you know, it, to, to each person, um, it, it's variable in what, what, what brings them enjoyment, but that is absolutely a key. I mean, we physicians know that life is not, you know, is not guaranteed. I mean, you, you got to take some time. You've worked really hard to get where you're at. You, you know, don't push everything off till, uh, in the name of financial independence, you know, take some time to enjoy what you've achieved and, and some of the fruits of your labor. And that's, that's, uh, that's personally my philosophy. I, I'm not, you know, I don't quite advocate the, uh, um, the, the amount of savings, but then at the same time, I do think it's it, the first thing they, you know, it, it is savings are important. Paying down debt is important. So, but I, I think for the most part, as physicians, uh, we have the luxury of, of, of doing more than the average, um, uh, average person. So you can kind of take parts of all of those things and still, you know, like you said, it may take you a little bit longer, but that's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, well, I want to, you know, thank you, uh, Dr. G, for, for coming on this podcast. This was really great. Uh, thank you for going into details. I, I think that the uh, listeners will really enjoy that, and ho- hopefully they're inspired uh, to kind of do a little bit of their own self-analysis and try to figure out what parts of their practice they can uh, optimize and improve and then, you know, kind of work more towards a, a better practice environment for them. Uh, I want to encourage the uh, the, the uh, listeners to also check out your blog at diversify dot uh, com. Is that that that's correct? Yes, d i v e r s e f i dot com. Perfect, perfect. And uh, that uh, you know, we'll look forward to see what uh, what's going on with you. Any any new um, uh, plans with your social media presence? So I am building this blog. As I said, I had a different blog, which I built for years. Um, This is a different one, but the flavor of what I write is similar. So I used to write about doctor stories and what it felt like to be a doctor. Um, Now I write more about finances, but I still kind of write it what it feels like either to be financially independent or what it feels like to be a doctor or even what the intersection of both of those things are. So there's a lot of stories Um, you know, my tagline is, um, personal finance with a twist. And the reason why is you're not going to find on my blog, kind of the typical, this is how you save for retirement. This is how you do a Roth IRA. Uh, there are people much better at me in that space. Um, what you'll hear from me are interesting stories about, about philosophy, about what it feels like, um, about different options for things like side hustles um, and a bunch of stories about life. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank my guest, Doc G, for coming on the uh, podcast and talking about how he was able to optimize his uh, his practice and to achieve a relatively high net worth at a young age. Uh, I hope this encourages you, um, the, the physician who are listening to this podcast, to take a look at your own situation and see if there's areas for optimization, whether it's in your practice or your own personal finance life. Uh, we can all make little improvements that can make significant uh, changes in our life. Uh, most importantly, what, when, when he realized that um, the office wasn't real, his, his outpatient office wasn't really adding much to his his practice, but was taking a significant amount of time. Um, I think there's a lot of areas that physicians tend to rely on that are just the things that we've always done that are, you know, maybe whether it's some sort of inertia keeping us um, in, in, in the lane that we're at. Uh, we, we really do need to take time and assess all aspects of our lives and, and see if there's areas for improvement. So I hope uh, Doc G inspired you to do that. I know he encouraged me inspired me to do that and um, hopefully there will be areas that will uh, improve. Let's continue the discussion further on the Dr. Money Matters Facebook group and uh, see if there's uh, comments there that can uh, inspire you and I hope you uh, leave comments to educate and inspire other physicians as well. Thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Dr. Money Matters. If this is the first episode you have heard, I appreciate you taking the time out and listening and encourage you to listen to our past episodes. I would also appreciate you leaving me a positive review on Apple Podcasts 
and also recommend you join our Facebook group where we have ongoing discussions about this and other topics in order to help each other reach our financial goals. Finally, I encourage you to subscribe to our email list and also to subscribe to the podcast itself on the various podcast app that you use in order to be kept aware when the latest episode comes out. Uh, More episodes of this podcast are available at www.drmoneymatters.com and on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Audio versions are also available on YouTube and Facebook. And you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Money Matters or on Facebook or Instagram at Dr. Money Matters, all spelled out. Thanks for listening. And if you get a chance, please leave a positive review for this podcast uh, as it helps uh, move the podcast up the rankings on iTunes and get it, gets it exposed to a wider audience. Thanks for listening once again, and stay tuned for another episode coming soon.